neighborhood A beautiful day in the neighborhood Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Hey, church, sing that with me one time. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Hello, Battle Creek. So glad that you are with us today. Interesting fact today, there are 12,000 children's shows on TV today. And if you have a young child, you know that, right? And what's amazing is that all that content is being fed into our children, and they remember one thing. Baby shark, do, 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 baby shark, do, do, right, daddy shark. Do, do. That's all they got out of all of this content that, that is coming their way. But in my day, uh, not that long ago, in, in the 70s and the 80s, there were two shows on TV, right? Sesame Street and, and Mr. Rogers. And, and you might have gotten lucky to see Captain Kangaroo or Electric Company when they came on the scene. But everybody knew Big Bird and everybody knew Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers was on the air for, anybody know? Almost 40 years, right? He, he, he went on the air in 1962, and it ran all the way to 2001. And over that time, literally millions of us watched. And, and more than that, he taught us how to love each other and care for each other. But who was this guy, this Fred Rogers guy? Anyone uh, know much about him? He had 40 honorary degrees, 40 of them along with an earned Masters of Divinity. He, he won p multiple awards, including a Peabody uh, Award. He was given a Presidential Medal of Freedom. He's in the TV Hall of Fame. He's listed as TV's greatest, or 50 greatest TV stars. If you go to the Smithsonian, which, which I have, in the Smithsonian you can see his famous sweater. A and what was he after? Was he trying to be famous? Was he trying to make a lot of money? Come on, he was on PBS. Uh, of course not, right? He, he, his goal uh, was to make a TV show that was geared just for kids, and he wanted to help all of us feel like neighbors. And he knew that not all kids felt that, and that some kids came from trouble, and some kids came from tough places. And so he would show up every afternoon after school and, and minister in a neighborly uh, way. And, and here's the thing. Did he do it because he was an entertainer? He wasn't. In fact, I would have said, even as a kid, he wasn't very entertaining, right? Is he a politician? No, he was not a politician. Do you know that he was a minister? In fact, he was a pastor. And he made this little TV show that started with this question. Say it with me, church. Won't you be my neighbor? Now turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, and let's go look at this passage of Scripture because that question looks a lot like a question that Jesus was asked. In fact, he was asked it often who is my neighbor? And, and he was asked all kinds of questions and other questions too, but a lot of them truthfully had to deal with this one idea uh, that, that we see in this passage of scripture, which it's in other gospels as well. But look at Luke 25, 10, 25. One day, an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus. You see where this is going, right? You don't want to be on that end of this equation, that you're standing up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? To which the guy said, the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, bingo, right, you, you got it. Do this and you will live. In other words, line up all of the laws in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. There are 365 of them in the first five books, by the way, one for every day. But it wasn't simplified that you keep one a day. You had to keep all 365 every single day and follow every single one of them. And so you line them all up and try to follow all of them every day, that would drive anyone crazy. 
But, but what Jesus was trying to say in, in his teaching when he narrowed it down is, is that you can fulfill every one of them, all 365 of them, with two simple steps. Love God and love your neighbor. To, to which, you know, we, we ask, well, how do we love God? What gift could I possibly give to God that he doesn't already have? And the answer is obvious, nothing, right? You can't. There's nothing you can give God. So, so God made it simple. He said, hey, if you want to love me, here's how you do it. Love your neighbor. And it's very easy to understand. It is very difficult to do. In fact, the religious expert wants to avoid the whole thing altogether. Let's continue the, the dialogue and watch what happens. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, when it comes to uh, loving our neighbors or not loving our neighbors, we, we actually consciously or not, want to justify it. And one of the reasons we want to justify it is because we can, in our own hearts, draw a line between these two ideas. And over here we say, sure, I would love God. Why wouldn't I love God? He's awesome, right? And he's full of mercy and he's full of goodness and he's full of, uh, you know, uh, grace. Well, I, of course I will love God, but love my neighbor. Have you met my neighbors? Surely that's optional, right? I, I'll just go over here, God, and get away from those that I can't love. Maybe that's the history of neighborhoods to begin with, it, it, it is that I wanted to get with people who are like me that I can love and get away from those that I can't love, and, and I'll just love you, God, but, but here's the thing. You can't divide, and you can't divorce loving God from loving your neighbor because it is absolutely impossible to love God without loving your neighbor. And, and those of us who grew up in church, look, you're, you're already checking out. You're like, I've heard this. I've heard this millions of times. Here's the question Jesus wants to ask us today. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with that? Truthfully, if I were just confessing to you today, I would say I'm not doing all the good. In fact, I moved to three and a half acres so they would be further away. And I'm far more, sometimes people want to debate scripture and, and talk about this scripture or that scripture. I'm like, hey man, I am far more interested in the scripture that I do understand and don't do than I am the part that I'm wrestling with trying to figure out. I'm still working on love my neighbor as myself. And we've been asking uh, the, the obvious, right? This is what happens when you are told by God you can't separate these true. You, you come with the most obvious question at that point, well, who's my neighbor? And who do I have to love according to Jesus? Another way to ask that that, you know, helps us understand it is, who would Jesus be neighbors with? Who would Jesus be neighbors with? And you have to think, I mean, you've, give, you've been given enough Bible around here to think, well, he, everyone, I guess, right? Right? In John 1, the Word was God and the Word was with God. And then, you know, come down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh or dwelt among us. Another translation says, and he moved into the neighborhood. He put on his earth suit. And by the way, Jesus, when he tells this story on the backside of this dialogue, the, great Samar or the Good Samaritan uh, passage of Scripture, you know that story. When he tells the Good Samaritan story, Jesus is making a very, very, very racially charged application in that day. I wish I had time to teach you that every rabbi had different uh, ways of answering what is the greatest of the commandments. People ask Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? That was a very common question for rabbis in that day. Very, very common. Because they wanted to know whose yoke was, you know, how your yoke was different from his yoke was different from his yoke. And, and some of them said, you know, it's love God and the Sabbath. And some of them said it's love God and, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, and there was one rabbi named Hillel that said it's love God and love your neighbor. And, and so they came to Rabbi Jesus and said, hey, what, what do you have to say? And he tells this story of the good Samaritan. And the Samaritan is the key in the story. Now, if you don't know what a Samaritan is, it was a different race than the Jewish people. And not just a different race, they were viewed as half-breeds by the Jewish people. In fact, the Jewish people theologically believed that Samaritans lost and forfeited the very image of God on them when they intermarried. And so what Jesus was doing here was not some little, you know, preschool story. He, he was going to the heart of you have to love people like you and you have to love people who are not like you. And, and maybe, I don't know, maybe the closest person on earth in our lifetime at, at doing this neighboring stuff is Mr. Rogers, right? I, I, I've already confessed to you. I don't think I'm doing a great job of it. And, and so this week and next week, we're, we're going to look at this idea of neighboring well. And Mr. Rogers was an expert at this won't you be my neighbor stuff. But we kind of think it's an option. 
But when we see everyone as our neighbor, it begins to make sense, and we begin to understand the command of Jesus, and then we can begin to love them in the same way that Jesus uh, loves them. And we begin to realize it's impossible to love God and not love your neighbor. And, and I'll just, you know, those of you who say, I've heard this a lot of times before, uh, I, I would just say to you, if you ha have led all of your neighbors in your neighborhood to Jesus Christ, take the next two weeks off. Okay, go, go to the beach, do whatever you got to do. If you've led all, everybody on your hall in your dormitory, at your university of Jesus, then take a break, okay? Take a break from church. If you're talking to all your coworkers regularly about Jesus and, and they know where you stand with Christ and you love all people the same, th then you're good. But if you're like your pastor, that your knowledge is greater than your action related to loving your neighbor, then you need to stay tuned uh, dur during these two weeks. And here, here's a question I want you to ponder for a second. How many people... It's October. We're 10 months into this year. How many people since January 1st have you led to Jesus? Personally. How many people have you led to Jesus Christ this year? And let me flip it for your comfort. How many people have led to Jesus this year? Personally. I, I've preached to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, actually, this year. And I've seen thousands of boys and girls and women and men uh, raise their hand, come forward, and, and accept Christ. But personally, how many people have I shared Jesus with? A whole lot less than that. And how many in my neighborhood? Z zero. And so what I want to say to you is I need this as much as you need this, maybe more uh, than, than anyone else. And here's the truth. My knowledge outweighs my obedience and my action on this neighboring stuff. And if it's true for me, I'm sure it's true for you. Certainly, I'm more spiritual than you, right? <laughs> and and I, I want you to know that I'm praying I am praying. This, this is a constant recurring prayer as I think about you and, and, and I rejoice over you and, I, and, and the Spirit of God leads me onto my knees for you. I am praying that God will do an amazing work in our church over the next few weeks. And I'm, I'm praying that you will not yawn at what Jesus Christ said is the second greatest commandment in the whole world. I'm praying that you will embrace it and the Holy Spirit will minister to you and will wake you up to this calling on the local church. In fact, let's pray before we go any further, okay? Father, today in heaven, we declare over uh, this church, thanking you for it. But Father, in this place, I pray you would minister life today. Holy Spirit, would you come and among every seed and among every person, among every man, woman, boy, and girl, every small child, every senior adult, would you minister life today? Would you convict by, by the Holy Spirit as to who you've called us to be and what you've done inside of us and how that's to play out in our lives as we engage and encounter others. Would you bring revival that, that could not be contained in the buildings that we call our churches, but Father, it would go into the streets and the highways and the hedges, and it would minister life, the life, the Zoe life of Jesus Christ in this city. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say, amen. Now you say, Pastor, why are you so amped up about this? Why is this so critical for, for today? Now, let me just tell you, the landscape in our land related to Christianity, if you're not paying attention, is not on the upswing. It, it, it's just not on the upswing. Charlie, would you say that's true? How, how, how many churches in Tulsa County? A ton. How many Baptist churches in Tulsa County? Yeah, how, how many of them will close their doors in the next 10 years? third of them will close their doors in, in, in the next 10 years. And, and we read about people leaving the church all the time. We read about people not coming back to church. You, you see people who are openly antagonistic in our culture to church. And hear me, church, we can't just dismiss that and say, well, they're haters. Haters are just going to hate, right? That's what haters do. And we, and we just want to dismiss this off. But we have to take an honest look at ourselves, we have to, and we have to ask, are we being the church that Jesus wants us to be? Because it is impossible to love God and not love your neighbor. So let me give you three reasons today why this is so critical uh, for our church in this day and age. Number one, what Jesus said we should be known for may not be what we are known for. 
And that is a problem. Do you remember what Jesus said would distinguish us from everybody else around us? It's John 13, in case you don't know. Verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my children. You are my, you are my followers. You are my disciples. If you love one another, that, according to Jesus, is what separates us from the rest of the world and, and that we love everybody always. That's the message of the church. We love everybody always. And you can wear a jersey to tell everyone who your favorite athlete is if you want to. You can wear a hat to tell everybody you're a Sooner. By the way, <laughs> praise the Lord right? They brought me an orange one and I burned it just <laughs> and, and, and put on my red one. You, you, could, you could wear a jersey to tell everybody you're a cowboy or, or a sooner, or God forbid you're a longhorn and, and we'll, we'll be a missionary to you. And, and, and so what, what I want to say, you could share a clip online from your favorite TV show. You can put a bumper sticker on your car to talk about your favorite breed of dog or advertise the fact that your children is in the honor roll, right? That's just a weird thing to put on a bumper sticker, but for everybody, you know, God bless you, right? It just seems slightly arrogant actually to put that on there. <laughs> My kids in the honor roll was yours, right? You know, we feel enough pressure already, okay? So just, just leave that bumper sticker at home. Those of you who are runners and freaky weird, you put 13.1 or 26.2 like you are any good at math uh, on your bumper sticker to say that you accomplished something, which by the way, I don't know if you saw it yesterday, some African guy, uh, an hour 59, finished 26.2 miles, an hour 59. That is a sub five minute mile for 26 miles. I can't fathom how a human body could do that and, and run that fast. But you guys put those, you know, accomplishment stickers on, on your 26.2. I finished a, a marathon. I've gone way more than that in my car than 26.2 miles. <laughs> and it just seems quite arrogant, actually. I don't have a sticker on my car that says PhD. <laughs> right? I mean, it just seems silly that we would put that. And I did, I told that joke once before, and one of you put a 0.0, .0 sticker on my car at the gym, and thank you for that. And, and, and so... <laughs> Listen, when Jesus was handing out badges that would separate us from everybody else, it wasn't about what we could display on a mug or slap on a bumper sticker. It was about how we love each other, the rest of our world, and our neighbors. And that's the one defining characteristic that is supposed to separate us from the rest of the world. And here's a question I want you to think about. How would your neighbor answer that question about you? We had a man after the first service come to one of our staff members and repent. said, I'm going home to repent to my neighbor today. He hit my mailbox with his car and I lost my witness with my neighbor and I'm going to go repent but because of, of what God did in my heart today. How would your neighbor answer that question about you? And if we took a poll in your neighborhood, how would you do? And it's not politics, it's not church, it's not a bumper sticker, it's love, according to Jesus. And just in case you misunderstand, I want you to hear me. I'm not talking uh, uh, about all kinds of weird stuff. I'm talking about recapturing what Jesus said. I'm not talking about redefining the whole of Christianity. We're not going to go hire a PR firm to, to help us send tweet after tweet out or get some video to go viral about the church. We, we don't need to repair the image of the church. We need to recapture what made her so great in the first place. The love of God. And, and, and you, you got to hear me. Listen, uh, uh, true love realizes that it is completely impossible to love God and not love your neighbor. And, and now balance that with the next reason this is so incredibly important in, in our culture today. Here's number two. Christians today are forced to take theological stances in our culture. Hard ones that the culture won't agree with, right? And, and nothing makes me more nervous as a pastor in this day and age when the press calls and says, hey, pastor, what do you think about filling the blank? And it's not because I'm afraid of the truth, and it's not because I love the truth. I love to declare the truth. What I'm afraid of is that my words will be taken the wrong way, right? And, and you are afraid of the very same thing in this charged culture that we live in. But when you look at the landscape of the culture today, it's different, isn't it? Wow, it's, it's so different. 
It's different than it was 50 years ago. It's different than it was 16 years ago when we started this church. Here's the truth. It's different than it was two years ago. And and there is so much pressure from the world for us as believers to respond. But it's not just from out there. There's a whole sense of urgency within our church for us to take a stand on, on, on the Word of God today. And there are stances that must be made today. They must be made today, but it is imperative that they are made in love. You can be right and still do it the wrong way. You you, you can say the right thing in the wrong way. It's completely possible. But when you come at an issue with genuine Jesus love in your heart, I've seen it a thousand times. I've got friends on different side of the issue uh, uh, on thousands of issues for me. And we have dialogue and we have questions. I don't know if you paid attention to Ellen and George W. And, and, and that whole deal. Man, her whole camp is eating her for lunch because she has a friend who doesn't agree with her on, on, on some things. you got to ask, where's the love in all of this? And, and by, I can say something that somebody else disagrees with a thousand percent. And if I've communicated in love and love them well, that they will say, I disagree, but I respect your opinion. Why? Because love is so much louder than words. And you have to live with scriptural stances. We have to. We have to. We have to be sure about them, by the way. And you have to say, look, this is the Bible, and here's what it says, and I believe that. But hear me, the greatest scriptural stance, period, is truth in love. Truth in love. And Christians have always been viewed as weird and narrow-minded and judgmental. The problem is now we're known as hateful and bigoted. And it's not just the mean, freaky, picketing church people, right? And, and, and you know, they've been to several events I've done, and, and, and they're just mean people. It's not just them. It's people in normal church today are viewed that way. And, and Jesus once said, my words will act like a sword that will separate you. Jesus was not prescribing that we be divisive. He was saying that when you share my stances and when you share my word, people will react to it. He just knew that. He just knew it would happen. And we can't control their reactions. We can only control our attitudes. And we can take a stance and be a jerk, or we can take a stance and do it in love. 1 Corinthians 13 says that if I don't love, right, I'm like a a, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. With love, it's louder than all of our words. Without love, our our words are just like banging on a a, a cymbal. And no one will listen, and our words will become annoying to all those around us. But with love, they they will be able to see God's heart on the matter. And Jesus, by the way, he did it amazingly. You see it over and over and over when you read the Gospels and the stories about Jesus on earth. He he could braid his words with both truth and love beautifully. He he had a way of speaking to the heart and an issue and taking a stand without making that person feel judged or condemned. Look, look, the woman caught in adultery is a perfect example, right? In in John chapter 8, he took a stand. Make no mistake about it. He took a stand. He said to her, go and sin no more, but he did it in love. There's no one left to condemn you, and neither do I. What about Zacchaeus? That's another one, the tax collector of the day, right? Was he a good man? No, he wasn't a good man. You couldn't paint him from any angle as a good or an all right guy. What, What he needed in, in my view, is to be punched in the face. In Jesus' name, of course. <laughs> but what did Jesus do with him? Jesus said, let's hang out. You, you, you and me. Let's hang out. And he sat down and had a meal with him. An experience of love and an experience of intimacy and, and so clearly that Zacchaeus said, you know what? I'm going to pay back everyone that I have ever cheated. Hear me, church. He did not change his mind because somebody yelled at him. He did not change his mind because somebody argued or debated with him. He changed his mind because somebody loved him. And Jesus never separated his theology from love. He never sacrificed the truth for being liked. He never sacrificed love for being right. He was the perfect combination of the two, and we can be too, because he lives in us and he is empowering us. John 1.14 again, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he was full of grace, and he was full of truth. I read a, a book this last summer. You should read this book about a, a lady named uh, uh, Rosario Butterfield. 
You should read her book. It's fascinating and it's very well written. Rosaria Butterfield was a professor and a chief spokesman for the LGBT community. And in her own book, in her own words, she tells the story of being invited over to dinner by a pastor and, and his family. And, and when she sat and ate dinner, she was flabbergasted with how they loved one another and for how they loved her. She was blown away because he and his family and his children and his wife understood and demonstrated that it is impossible to love God and not love your neighbor. By the way, in her own words, she would say the LGBT community that she so uh, profusely stood up for and took up for and spoke for have been very hateful to her since she left not loving at all, right? So it's critical, number one, but because love is what we should be known for. Number two is because we are forced to take tough stands on tough issues in this culture. The, the third reason this is so important is when our knowledge of loving our neighbor exceeds our obedience, we will miss out on the greatest experiences available to us in this lifetime. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a parable. In fact, he tells a couple of them. And he talks about a lost sheep and then a lost coin, and then he moves on to a, a, a lost son. And in each of those stories that Jesus tells, there is this phrase that repeats itself all three times. The phrase is rejoicing in heaven. Rejoicing, not, not in a stadium, rejoicing in, in heaven. And I used to think that that meant the angels were kind of figuring it out and throwing a party and, and God was kind of sitting there, you know, maybe, maybe he would smile and, you know, approve with a nod to the angels. But when you really look at that text and understand that text, if you read it, God is the one doing the rejoicing. He is the one lifting the roof and doing the touchdown dance and doing all of that. And if anybody's watching, it's the angels and God in heaven is rejoicing. And one of the godliest things we can do is rejoice when other people get saved. And there's a joy from leading one person to Jesus Christ that's unlike any other joy in our lives. Truthfully, I don't understand it. I do not understand it. But when I stand and give an invitation in a stadium and thousands of people come and give their life to Jesus, there's crazy, crazy joy. I feel like this is what I was made for. This is what God put me on planet Earth for. But I, if I'm honest with you, when I sit across coffee with somebody and I lead one person to Jesus Christ all alone, one from death to life, there's more joy in that than there is in that. And I can't explain that to you. The math doesn't work, but there is something about it when God uses you to help one person cross a line that, that it's like a drug for the child of God. And, and, and as your pastor, I just I want you to hear me say, I am praying, praying, praying. As we just began a new school year, a new church year, here's one of my prayers, and I just want to tell it to you up front. I'm praying that every single one of you will have the chance and have the opportunity to lead one person to Jesus this year. I'm praying it for you, that you will have that encounter, you will have that opportunity to, sit, to invest in somebody's life, to earn the right, to talk to them about Jesus, and, and you will do it in a successful way, all of you, one time this year. And, and, and speaking of that, let me just, I need to make a, a, an announcement today. One of the things that we have loved here at Battle Creek for, for a long time, it is hosting the big TC Toy Show uh, every Christmas. And, and over the span of 15 years, we did it for 15 years, over that span, we have seen thousands of people give their lives to Jesus Christ. And more importantly, as a pastor, I, 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 thousands have had an on-ramp to be the hands and feet uh, of Jesus Christ. But I want you to know something very important today, and it's important that you listen to me over the next few minutes. We have met as a leadership team and we have decided, both strategically and uh, 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 crucially, to take a break from TC Toys uh, this coming December. There's a lot of reasons for it, okay, and two primary ones. N number one is, is we don't know how to vet the needs of the people who come to TC Toys. We're not good at it. When buses are being chartered to drive people from Kansas City to Tulsa to, to, to receive toys, we, we, you realize there's some sort of a dilemma going on on what it is we were trying to do in, in the first place, okay? And so in other words, we do a poor job of making sure that we're helping those who really need the help. But hear me, church, that's not on them. That, that's on us. But, but the second primary reason that we're going to take a break from it is that TC Toys has been incredible at helping people know God. 
But for 15 years, and it's not for lack of trying, and it's not for lack of strategy, and it's not for lack of praying, and it's not for lack of one effort after another, we have not found out how to use TC Toys to help people find freedom, discover their purpose, or make a global difference. We, we hadn't figured out how to do it. And so, truthfully, TC Toys helps us accomplish one of, of our four main objectives in, in our mission. And, and so we're going to take a break from TC Toys. Watch. Not to step back from the gospel, but to step up to the gospel. And instead of focusing so much on one weekend a year, we are going to be launching, really not launching, we're going to be broadening something that, that will be running for 52 weeks per year. We call it Care Portal. What, what is Care Portal? Care Portal is a proprietary software that, that is being tailored just for us. And it will help us to take uh, a whole nother level uh, of neighboring into our community. And what it does is it allows outside organizations, primarily today, DHS, who are good at vetting needs to vet the needs for us. And then when a need comes is placed by a DHS worker into our care portal system, it will be paired up both geographically and strategically with one of our Battle Creek community groups at the campus closest to the need. Now, we've been beta testing this for a few years now. And we haven't talked about it, but 60 of our community groups for several years have been involved in what we call Care Portal, and it's been incredible. And they are meeting needs all over this city every single week, thousands of them, actually, for, for the last two years. And now we're ready to bring it into all of our community groups. And I want you to hear me say today that I, my goal is 100% of our community groups would participate in Care Portal, okay? And I, I could tell you all kinds of stories. A few weeks ago, a young man... <clears throat> It, his, his wife left. She was the source of abuse in, in their home. He had three children, and, and he worked two jobs to take care of these three children. One of the children got sick, and so he spent two weeks off from work taking this kid to one hospital, to one doctor, to one imaging after another for two weeks. He was doing exactly what a loving dad would do, but he's an hourly worker, and he was not getting paid during these two weeks. And, and, and so the need came through DHS. They said, hey, if this guy can't pay his rent, we're going to have to remove the children from the home. If you will help us help him with his rent, the children can stay in a loving family with their father who loves them. And, and so our people were able to come in and help him with the rent and share Jesus with him. And, and I've been told he's going to be at the downtown campus today. And, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to minister life in, in somebody's heart. In fact, the DHS worker, caseworker who is a part of that will be at the downtown campus today as well because he saw what was happening in this guy's life. And so it's just story after story after story. But what we have the opportunity to do is to hit people on a cross-section of their life where they happen to have a need. And by the way, we will all hit that cross-section in one day or another in our lives where we have a need in our lives. And as the gospel bearers, the, those who carry the good news of Jesus Christ, we can meet that need, but not just meet the need, share Jesus with them. Last week, uh, a, a young lady who aged out of the DHS system, she aged out of the system as an 18-year-old mother of two small children. And she found an apartment, she found a job, she's doing her best to make this a go, but DHS put in the need in Care Portal and said, we're going to have to remove the baby from this home if she doesn't have a car seat for the baby. She can't drive with the baby in a, in a laundry basket in the back of the car. We have to get her a car seat. One of our family said, you know what? I have a car seat sitting on top of the refrigerator in my garage that I'm not using. I can take this car seat. They met this woman at Quick Trip. They gave her the car seat and they said, hey, let me tell you about the love of God. Do, do you have a church home? This is how this thing works. And, and, and it is going to be huge. And, and, and you, you will watch it happen and we will go out into the highways and the hedges and the byways ministering to real needs. The community group, I got the text this week on Monday, three needs were put out to community groups. They were met within 10 hours all three of them. And they were saying, can we release more needs in, into our community groups? And so my goal is for 100% of our community groups to be involved in this every single week of the year. And by the way, it's going to be difficult. I had two caseworkers catch me this morning after the nine o'clock service. And both of them, one of them told me the reason that she is here is because of the way our groups ministered to the people she was caring for. She came here and met Jesus because of this whole thing. 
And, and another one came in, a man, and said, I, I'm a DHS care worker. Thank you so much. I just want you to know this makes a big difference. We are handcuffed in what we can say about Jesus. And by the way, DHS, this is tier one. We're going to come in years to come with tier two and tier three and tier four. The ass is going to get bigger, so get good at this one. They're not making us do background checks and jumping through all those hoops to do this because they're not viewing us as babysitters. They're viewing us as people who are friends. And if a friend wants to come along, in addition, uh, we, we can say to somebody who's near the downtown campus, hey, we, we, we put a metro bus stop right in front of the downtown campus. And a lot of people who live in that area are, are, are can't get to church because of transportation. They can't get to the doctor because of transportation. They can't, transportation is a big issue. And, and so uh, at 9 o'clock and at 11 o'clock, we'll have a staff member at the downtown campus who will sit on that bus stop, and when people get off to come to church, we'll get on and pay for their bus ticket to come to church because it shouldn't be an issue for people coming to hear uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the community groups will spring into action and meet those needs and share Jesus. Make no mistake about it. We are not going just to meet needs. You will cheat people if you go just meet needs and don't give them eternity in heaven with the person of Jesus Christ. We're going to do both. And some of you say, I don't know how to do that. We're going to teach you. Okay, so we're going to have days. I can teach you to share your faith in 30 minutes. And if you'll practice it and do it, God will use it and he will, he will make you effective at it. And so we're going to have training days. We'll have training days to help you learn how to get in the ditch with somebody who happens to be in the ditch today and not come acting like a Messiah or a Savior, like you're going to try to pull them out of the ditch. Just get in the ditch and love them and hug them and say, hello, and I'm glad you're here, and I, I, I just want to be your friend. I just want to be another human being in your life who is going to uh, be, come alongside you. And instead of showing up on a Sunday afternoon and then picking out a toy, we get to go make a real difference in real time on their turf, and that is a huge advantage. And let me tell you what I think is better than you coming on one day in December and watching two pastors share the gospel and lead hundreds of people to Jesus is for hundreds of you to get to lead one person to Jesus this year. That's way better. Way better. So, so, so get in a community group and encourage that group to be on mission. I'm giving you permission to harass your community group leader and, and, and the host home. The link will go out this week. In the next 48 hours, 72 hours, that link will go out for every community group to sign up and, and, and be a part of this thing. Who, who is my neighbor? Back to Luke 10 for a minute. The religious ex expert asked Jesus this question. And we soon learn, according to this text, it's one of those conversations that was planned out in advance. He asked the question to set up something he wanted to say to begin with, right? In fact, Luke makes this very clear. He was justifying himself. And obviously, he was feeling really good throughout most of the story until we got to verse 28. And then Jesus throws a curveball into this scenario. And, and what the religious expert had in mind for the answer, it was not the story of the Good Samaritan. I can just tell you. That was not what he had in mind. And it's not what we have in mind either, right? It's not what we would expect. Well, we know the parable of the Good Samaritan, but it is a little bit confusing. But it would appear to all of us when we read that story, the neighbor was the man who was beaten and left for dead. That, that's the neighbor, right? Who are we going to neighbor? But at the end of the story, Jesus makes it clear that the Samaritan who helped the man proved to be the neighbor. And so here we are, uh, along with this religious expert, trying to figure out who we're supposed to love. And Jesus turns the question around on us. And he's saying, church, stop asking who is my neighbor there are deeper questions to ponder and when we're done trying to establish is this my neighbor the decisive issue of love remains the real question is who am i that's the question who, who am i and are we going to be like the Samaritan who gives help when help is needed? Or are we going to get caught up in questions about who are we supposed to help and when and where and how and, and, and all of that nonsense? Listen to me. Theologically, I'm about to lay some powerful truth on you, and you need to hear it and you need to receive it. Listen to this. Our identity in Christ actually is what informs the way we think about our neighbors. 
who we are matters first. L last month in, in Jesus Hates Religion, we said in Christ, we are given right standing before God. The Bible word is justification, right? Just as if I, I, I've never sinned. And we are propelled in love for God to others by the new power of the Spirit that resides within us. That's sanctification. And that affects the way that we see those around us. Not because they have become, they have become something different, but because we ha have become something different. And God's justifying work for us and His transforming work in us are a commission to the good works and the path that he prepared beforehand for us, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, that we should walk in these works he prepared in advance for us. And on this path are real people with real lives, with real stories, and now when we encounter them, they are a divine call to the children of God. They are an opportunity and they are a mandate for us to be who we are in Christ. And for years, I've been asking our staff team for the last probably three years, give me another Laura Dester. And you say, what, what is that? Some of you have, weren't around when we tackled that issue. DHS built a beautiful multi-million, multi-million, multi-million facility in Tulsa, Oklahoma, over on the north side to shelter kids who were coming into the system. About the time we were launching Adopted and, and this foster care ministry and all the initiatives that we were tackling at that time, front and heavy. And God put it in my heart and I said it to the church one day before I consulted with anybody. Church, we're going to shut it down. So what do you mean? We're going to put Christian homes all over this city so that the need to put them in a shelter even for one night becomes non-existent. And we did it. And it sits over there boarded up today. And, and, and by the way, you can't tackle that issue once and for all, right? You could solve all the kids today and tomorrow somebody will mistreat a kid or abuse a kid and, and, and the system happens, right? You gotta stay with it and you gotta stay on it. And it began with me and Chris Campbell in his office several years ago with the DHS, the head of DHS in the state of Oklahoma. And we said, hey, we, I don't want any of those kids in that shelter on Thanksgiving weekend. And she said, that's a really good goal. I don't know how we can accomplish it. Maybe in the next 14 months we could pull that off by next Thanksgiving. And I said, nope, this Thanksgiving, two months. Figure it out. And she did. And that Thanksgiving, we emptied the whole shelter out for the weekend. And then we said, let's do Christmas. And the next Christmas, we emptied the whole shelter out for Christmas. And then we started teaching and asking people to be foster care parents and, and, and taking kids into their home and being respite care. And, and the issue, a big dent has been put in it. We got a lot of ground to go cover and, and say, what do you mean? Give me another Laura Dester. Here's what I've been saying. We, we started sending community groups to Laura Dester on Sunday nights to barbecue with the kids and, and kick soccer balls around. And we overtook Laura Dester for a number of years, for a number of years. We would have three adults for every one child on a Sunday night at Laura Dester. And we overwhelmed the whole thing. And it was like, can you send less people? And I, I've been saying, I, we need this as a church. We, we need this next thing that, that, that takes the DNA strands of our church that's crazy evangelistic, that wants to lead people to Jesus on a regular basis, that cares about orphans and cares about those in the foster care system and the fatherless in the world that Jesus loved with all of his heart, with all of his might, with all of his soul, right? And we're going to follow his example. And, and, and the needy in, in our community. And by the way, the, the, those of you who, who live in wealthy neighborhoods, let me just say to you, th this is going to be one of the greatest paths. I forgot to mention this at nine. I, I got a neighbor I've invited to church 15 times. And about 10 of those times he told me he was going to come. And zero of those times has he come. Zero. And the truth is he will not give me permission to share the whole gospel with him. We're not there. But you know what I can do? I can say, Chris, come go with me to give this car seat to this little girl. And he will go. He will go. And he will get to hear me share the gospel with her when he wouldn't give me permission to share it with him. Are you watching how this is going to play out? It, it, it is going to be grassroots gospel. And of course, we could make thousands of qualifiers. 
the, the good Samaritan didn't give his change to, to, to that guy so he could fill up his whiskey flask. That would be a lousy use of his resources, and it would be a lousy use of our resources. But perhaps uh, we should be more concerned that we get lost in all of those qualifiers about when helping hurts and, and, and toxic charity and, and when, 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 who is the poor and who is my neighbor. We should be more concerned getting lost in all of those qualifiers. And, and when the most important question there is, hey, what's Jesus doing? And we would do well to give these things thought and careful consideration, but here's all I'm proposing. Let's let DHS do all that. Let's let them vet them and put the need through, and then let's go meet them in, in, in Jesus' name and share Christ with these people. And, and we, may we never lose sight of the central issue that God made us new. He, he made us new creatures in Christ, righteous before Him, and empowered to love others for His sake. And, and when it comes to loving our neighbor, can our obedience, church, exceed our knowledge? Let, let, let me give you a couple of practical steps to take, okay? Number, number one is this. I, I've been telling you for weeks, two weeks from today is one of our three gospel Sundays all year long, okay? And, and on October the 27th, fall free for all, there'll be all kinds of nonsense for children and, and, and games and all of that stuff for parents and families of children and all of that. Maybe Mr. Rogers will be here. I'll make an appearance. Is he alive? No, he won't be here. <laughs> But Clayton King will be. And, and there's no way for me to oversell this to you. I, I just want to say to you, he is gifted by God as an evangelist. He has the gift of the evangelist. And when he shares the gospel, people respond. It doesn't make any sense. I'm smarter than him. But he just when he does this, people come. <laughs> And, and we cannot miss that opportunity. So, so step number one is this. I need you to invest in your neighbors, to invest in your kids' ball teams, to invest in the people that work with you over the next two weeks. Invest to the degree that you have somebody with you on October the 27th. You understand the mandate? It's not for you to go out there and you know leave a banana on somebody's porch. It's for you to invest to the degree that you have somebody with you on October the 27th. That's the mandate, okay? And, and we'll watch and see what God will do on that day. He's, he's crazy gifted. But here's the second one, and, and, and even bigger. Get in a community group. Get in a community group and lock arms with people in that group to make a difference in this community. And when opportunities come to be trained, to, 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 to go through care portal training, and, and we're going to train you, when, get in those trainings. And let's take the opportunity to use this to help people know God, find freedom, discover a purpose, and make a global difference. Would you pray with me across all of our campuses this morning? Father, I, I pray for our church today. And I pray you administer life in every part of it. Father, I pray for every group, hundreds and hundreds of groups, and I pray, Father, they would get charged up, amped up, ready to go, empowered by the Holy Spirit to go meet real needs in the name of Jesus. And I pray that every one of our people could lead somebody to Christ in the next 12 months. I pray, Father, that, that you would take whatever knowledge we have and you would help us to let our obedience exceed it. I pray that our groups would not be known as for their knowledge and for how deep they will go and how much study they will do and how many books they can read and how, how many Hebrew and Greek words they could figure out. Father, I pray whatever the knowledge is, great to, to small, that our obedience would exceed it. 
I pray over our groups today, Father, that uh, have older people in them who, who don't have a whole lot of energy but have a whole lot of money. And, and, and Father, they could begin to resource some of these needs. I pray for these young groups for, with young singles and, and young marrieds who don't have any money but they have a little bit of time and a little bit of bandwidth to deliver these car seats or this twin bed or this bunk bed. And I pray you'd bring these equations together. Father, I pray that we could all be involved in one way or another, that there would not be a hurdle that we couldn't get over in, in order to love people like Jesus loved them. And so, Father, take us further than we've ever been before. Make us more obedient than we've ever been before. Make us better disciples because of what you're doing in us and what you want to do through us. So we look forward to the works prepared in advance for us, and we thank you for them. We are so excited about them, Lord. And we pray that you would take us there. And I pray that our conversations in the days to come will be, what are we going to do with all these people? How could we possibly do enough services? How could we possibly add enough campuses? Where could we put more groups? Who's going to be the host home? Who's going to be the leader? Father, I pray that that would be the dilemma that we would face in the future. And we thank you that you'll meet those needs as well. And so, Father, over our church, we pray you'd have your will and have your way. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you pray with me right where you're seated? I just want to lead you in a prayer helping you do that. I'm going to pray it out loud. I'm going to ask you to pray it out loud. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So I want to help you do those two things. You're you're not going to pray alone. There's going to be men and women and boys and girls all around you praying with you. But if you want to trust Christ right where you're seated, would you just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but today I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin. Jesus, come into my life to be my Lord, my Savior, my forgiver. In Jesus' name we pray. And together we all say, amen and amen. Would you thank the Lord today? Salvation is the truth.